Part two is coming up, which is going to be pretty special. But in the meantime, while the band is taking a little breather, um, we did promise an interview, and the interview is coming right up. And a few words from an old colleague of mine right now. Good night, Steve Whitton here. You, you may remember me from such TV shows as... Uh, yeah, you probably don't remember me at all, but I did do a pop show back in the late 70s called Music Express on Channel 7. We had a lot of fun back in those days, I can tell you. One of the interviews I did was with a, a band, or well, two members of a band, called The Angels. That was Rick Brewster Jones and John Brewster Jones. Well, on the day... They came into the studio, very reluctant to talk, very much under the influence of, you know, probably a few pharmaceuticals, I might add. Uh, and the interview, well, it was a dismal failure. We're going to have a look at it right now, and you can see for yourself. Back on Music Express, and uh, we've got the guys from the Angel Pool, two of them at the moment. We've got uh, Rick and uh, John Brewster. Hi, nice, Steve. How are things, fellas? You're back in town after a, what, a couple of months' absence, I suppose? With, yeah. Uh, Touring, where, whereabouts are you playing at the uh, Sweethearts at the moment? Sweethearts, yeah. How's it going down there? Pretty yeah. good. Not bad. Rick, fine. You're <clears throat> destroying them with the rock and roll. I don't know. I think they're destroying them. <laughs> <laughs> so I heard, yeah. The new album, uh, of course, for the Angels is the, uh, the important thing on the scene at the moment for the boys. Um, the Face to Face album, um, 75,000 copies, I believe. Apparently, yeah. John, yeah. Can yeah. tell us a bit about the album itself and uh, how long it took and where you did it. And... Well, we. Uh... Uh, did it at Albert's, it's the same place we did face to face. Mm -hmm. we, we did it a little bit differently to face to face. We uh, um, put amps in different rooms and the production's a bit different. Um, but we, we also wrote all this, or nearly all of the songs on this in the studio, mm -hmm. which is a bit different from face to face again, because most of that stuff was written on the road. Um, so you had a bit of time to uh, sit down and think, did you, this time? Yeah, we mm -hmm. took about two and a half months on it. You have a quiet one here, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> you get involved sort of with John and uh, and Doc on the songwriting songwriting side of things, or oh, yeah. fairly heavily. Yes. Yeah. 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 <laughs> <He's talking> <laughs> How's Doc anyway? I haven't seen him for a while. I haven't seen him for a while either. Oh, I see. He's sort of out there after a heavy night. <laughs> stage. He's turned into a bit of a recluse these days. Yeah. So tonight at the uh, the Finsbury and tomorrow night. Yeah. Yeah. Then we go yeah. back to Sydney. Yeah. And, uh, doesn't say much, does he? No, he no, doesn't talk much. <laughs> <laughs> we're going back to Sydney next week, and uh, I think we're doing a, uh, a couple of shows at the Elizabethan Theatre there with 2SN, mm. um, oh, which good. they're uh, recording and broadcasting. And uh, I think it'll be broadcast here in, in Adelaide next Sunday. Right. Nice one. Which well, will be uh, the stage show, the mm. complete stage show, which is face to face on this album. Great. Oh, well, good luck with the album anyway, No Exit, and also uh, the single Shadow Boxer. Rick and John from uh, The Angels, thanks for coming in. Good luck right, to Kensbury yeah. tonight and tomorrow night. Here's, uh, hang on, who we got? Georgie Harrison and True Love. <laughs> yeah, that pretty well sums up 1979 and the Face to Face album with uh, the Brewster Jones boys from The Angels. But uh, I've got to say, John is now a very close friend of mine. We, we do live very close to each other down, uh, down the south coast on the Fleurio Peninsula. However, I would like just to see now how they perform. Greg Fingers Clark is about to have a chat with them. Let's see if they're any better. <laughs> oh, no pressure, Steve, at all. Um, although there's been a little substitution. Uh, Rick's, Rick's on the bench and subbing in for him is Dave Gleeson tonight, but in the same position as you were 41 years ago. Yes, and, and uh, I can tell you that uh, Rick doesn't speak any, any, any more than he did in that interview right now. <laughs> so it might be worth three words this time instead of two last time? Well, if you're lucky. <laughs> That's why Dave's here. <laughs> Welcome, guys. Anyway, we've Thank enjoyed you. the first set. We're here. We are at half time. We've got a second set to go. And Dave, uh, welcome to the interview chair as well. No, nice to be here. I love it. And you're loving being in the Angels, of course. You've been with them for nine years, about that. Yeah, about that. Oh, look, it's a. Uh, I, I, I never would have dreamed it because I just, you know, the obviously growing up as a kid, the Angels were like uh, a hugely influential band to us, but. Uh, when, uh, when I was asked to get involved, I was uh, well, over the moon. How, how did the Ducks get in a row to, to enable you to do this? I mean, you were with the Jets, and, and you know, what were the circumstances that allowed you to you know, slip into this role? Well, I remember I was up 
lost to Tun Curry in New South Wales uh, on holiday, and the Angels came through. And um, I, I hooked up with John, and I think John might remember he played me some songs in the car that he'd been doing. Mm-hmm. And um, and then it was probably oh, only another 12 months later or something, um, after he'd had a, a, a great time that night, that I went and saw them at a place called uh, The House in, in Harndorf, uh, the German house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, beautiful little spot. And uh, edged me way up the front and um, saw the boys. And uh, during a break, I went backstage and... Um, John said, do you want to get up and do an Angels song? And I said, I'd love to. He said, what Angels songs do you know? And I said, oh. <laughs> uh, I don't. <laughs> I don't. Turns out I don't. There's so many brilliant songs. But, uh, yeah, it kind of came, grew from that. I got up and played with the boys and they'd, uh, John and, and Rick and Chris Bailey were uh, doing some songs together and I just went in and had a crack and it all grew from there. Look, I mean, really, I, I think you guys have been really fortunate to, to find Dave. I mean, Doc was a highly charismatic guy. It just, it's, it just seemed the logical fit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, Rick and I, I, I still can't believe how that all came together. And I remember when I made the phone call to Dave and, uh, and I, I said, you know, and I think that was after the house gig, you know, where Dave, you know, just sort of sidled up close to the stage and, and he's... Did right. I said, How, you, "Do you know any Angel songs?" He said, "I know all of them." And, uh, but anyway, uh, Doc had left the band, and uh, Rick and I got talking. And after that gig, because we just looked at each other and sort of started nodding. Mm-hmm. And uh, look, it's been—it's getting close to ten years now. Can you believe that? Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, Dave's been wonderful from, the, from day one. People say about stepping into shoes. He never stepped into anyone's shoes. He just had his own shoes on. But he's his own guy. Yeah, but uh, Doc, uh, oh, sorry, Dave is, um, has got a, a kind of a timbre in his voice which really uh, has some connections there and sounds great with our repertoire. Yeah. Um, so, you know, from day one it's been absolutely fantastic. You know, we, we remember Doc very fondly. Yeah. Um, in the early days in particular when we were driving around Australia in the old EH station wagon with no, no uh, proper tyres, retread tyres. Base spin on the roof, the whole thing was top heavy. And we did, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of miles. And, and it was miles in those days. So, so for the newcomers who, to, to watching the Angels, as you are this evening, uh, it was, uh, firstly, it was the Moonshine Jug and String Band? Yeah, which we remember very fondly. And, uh, in fact, we've just... Uh, we call Rick the shopkeeper at the moment because he's selling all these CDs. We have we found this uh, CD that we did back in about 92 when we had a reunion. Mm-hmm. And, when you, and we also did the Denton show. And when you look at Doc on that show, he's just, he it actually didn't sing the song, the song I was singing. And you just look at Doc and that, he, no, I've never seen him happier. It was just like to, re, to, to redo that band for yeah. uh, what was only a couple of weeks, I think. It was just so fantastic. So we always remember the old Chuck band as a great thing. And of course, it was a great thing here in Adelaide, you know. That, I mean, we really how, how, did, how did that evolve? Was it a quick evolution from that to the Keystone Angels? I wrote a song called Keep You On The Move um, and we went into, I think it was Derek Jolly's studio in Melbourne Street and we recorded it and it, it was just obvious that we were starting to head towards rock and roll. Uh, and of course the jug band music, a lot of, it was, a lot of those songs were ba- based in the 20s and even earlier like Gus Cannon's Jug Stompers and all that, that was recorded pre-1920 and that, I mean, that music was just fantastic. But had we stayed the the, the, um, the the Moonshine Jug and String Band, we wouldn't have developed as songwriters. It, you know, we, we would have been writing songs that were trying to sound like the twenties. You know, and that song "Keep You on the Move." Uh, and I think you were at Five Ka at the time, were you? Maybe not. Maybe not. not, not well, Daisy was. I reckon. I reckon he's the guy that started playing it on yeah. radio, yeah. and and it went number four in the charts. Wow. And that's when I went up to uh, firstly Rick. Um, and, I, and Rick's a man of few words, as you know, if you've already seen. And I, I remember saying to him, you know that band Sherbet? And he said, yep. And I said, I reckon if we start a rock band, we can knock them off in 12 months. What do you reckon? He said, yeah, okay. And then I went to Doc, and Doc and I spent the entire night talking about it. And about 9 o'clock in the morning, Doc said, yeah, let's do it. Yeah. <laughs> there was a lot of talking involved. Oh, yeah. yeah. 
Maybe a few drinks as well. Drinks? Oh, yes, there was. There's probably... <laughs> There might have been some other substances, but anyway, we won't go into that. But <laughs> now, John, just staying back in the early days, uh, of course, the uh, the Angels started off with Alberts. Tell us about the Alberts' influence. Of course, you would have been working closely with Harry Vander and George Young back in those those formative days. Yeah, it's, I've got to tell you, Greg, it's an uh, experience of a lifetime. It's uh, uh, the, b both of those guys were just amazing. George, in particular, uh, I've related to George in particular because he's just he was a genius, an absolute genius. And he could inspire you just by talking. I mean, musically. Sometimes he'd sort of start grunting, you know. <laughs> he'd go like that, and you go, oh, that's a great idea. And you go in with the guitar and start coming up with ideas. So, um, George and Harry handed the production over to Rick and me. He took, took us out in the hallway and uh, uh, said that they wanted to hand the production over. And, and, then, and I, was I was absolutely crestfallen because I thought they'd lost interest. And we hadn't had any hits at that stage. It was all very tough, you know. But they dumped us in it and um, working along with Mark Opitz and we came up with Face to Face. So. Uh, but jo George was so smart, he would have seen something de developing and he hadn't lost interest at all. He would have seen something developing in us and then gone, you know, we should let those guys develop their own ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, but and apparently you've got a really good story about a, a, a fabulous advance you got from Albert's um, Tell us about that really substantial advance. Yeah, well, we were completely flat broke, owed a fortune, or seemed a fortune at the time, which probably was, actually, and, uh, and things weren't going too well for us. And George came up with this idea, and George never, ever told you what we should do. He, never, he would never say, you should do such and such. He'd just say, have you thought about having your hair cut short? And we went, oh, no, no, we wouldn't do that. Could, those days, you know, I had a bit more hair than this. And... Um, <laughs> and, he, and, and he said, you know, it'd be interesting though, because if you had your hair cut short, you'd be the first band in Australia to have short hair, you know, because everything was long hair back in the 70s, you know. And you go away and you think about these things on George, and you go, you know what, that's a good idea. We'd already been to, to Albert, to George and Harry looking for an advance because we were so broke, we just didn't think we could survive. And, uh, and they turned us down, and George actually said, you know, one day you'll thank us. Because uh, they never took, they never gave you advances, and you got paid from record one. But they did give us that one advance, and it's five dollars each to have a haircut, <laughs> <laughs> which really was a turning point. You know, it was like a tipping point. That and some of the songs we were starting to develop, like I Ain't the One was the first. When we, uh, I wrote that here in Adelaide actually, and and uh, we went in the studio and recorded it. I said, I've got this new song, and everyone started jumping up and down on the chairs, going, this is it, we found our sound. That was really wonderful, exciting times. The sound of the angels, and it's, it really has, uh, it's ingrained in the, in the psyche of the Australian public. I'm gonna go to Dave just for a second here. Dave, um, uh, in your time in the, the, uh, uh, with the angels, of course, uh, doing all the Angels material, your, your time with the Screaming Jets, people would have that opinion of you that you probably go home and listen to pretty heavy rock and roll or whatever. Do you have a guilty pleasure as far as music goes when you in your private time? What's a guilty pleasure you might indulge in musically? My favourite album of all time is Willie Nelson's Stardust, uh, where he does a whole bunch of uh, the standards. Uh, uh, sunny Side of the Street, just a, that's my... That's an album I, I, I put on, I can put it on every day and never grow sick of, but it's certainly, that's not what our Jets fans would, or, or Angels fans might think of uh, my musical taste. So Dave Gleason's guilty pleasure is Willie Nelson's <laughs> Stardust, all right. I can think we go the other side of the coin here. Uh, a little birdie told me, uh, whose initials are SW, that this, uh, this particular man here likes a bit of Bob Dylan. Would that be correct? Is that uh, your guilty pleasure? It's sort of the understatement of the, uh, the, the millennium, um, or the last century too. Uh, I, I, I discovered Dylan uh, back in about 63 with his very first album. I saw him in Adelaide at 66 when he had the band who weren't called the band then. They were his backing band. He did the first half on his own. Um, and I'm a massive, massive uh, fan. Um, probably my favourite album of all time is uh, Blonde on Blonde. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, there's a lot of great... And he still does great stuff. I mean, that thing he's done, that uh, Murder Most Fell, have you heard that? Not me. You've got to do it. <laughs> and you've got to read the lyric at the same time. He doesn't even sing. It's just talking about President Kennedy's murder. And it's incredible. 
Uh, just going to ask Dave now, how does he stack up compared to 41 years ago as far as the interview goes? JB, oh, he's, got, he's far more uh, articulate, I must say. <laughs> but, I mean, thankfully you haven't b- pulled out some of my early interviews where I don't know what... I, I, sometimes I don't know what I was saying. But just on Bob Dylan, didn't he sell his catalogue last week for $400 million? I reckon they got it cheap. I mean, that'd be worth a lot more. You didn't put a bid in? <laughs> <laughs> no, but, uh, you know, what, what a catalogue of songs. Do- you know, some people say, uh, yeah, he's, a, he's good with lyrics, but he's he, musically not that good. Are you kidding? Those, those choruses, they're, they're so hooky. They're fantastic. Dave, thank you so much for your time. Enjoy, going to enjoy the second half of the show. John, thank you for saving all those words from all those years ago and dishing them out tonight. Oh, yeah, sorry. I, 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 now I talk too much. My wife calls me, have a chat. <laughs> John Brewster, Dave Gleeson from The Angels. Part two of the show coming up in just a tick. <laughs>